Community interactions. All of the populations of organisms inhabiting a common environment and interacting with one another. There are three types of interactions that we'll talk about. The first is competition. That's when two different species are living in a similar area and they're using the same resource, like the food or the water or whatever it is. It could be, um, let's see, maybe rabbits and deer both eating grass. Um, they're both competing for that grass. Or it could be mice and hawks both eating squirrels. The next one is predation. And with that one, it starts with predator. And that's what it is. You have predator and prey. And so they don't live close to each other um, or on each other, but one of them will hunt down and eat the other one. And then the next one is symbiosis. This is a close interaction where the organisms are living, one is living on or in the other one, typically. And um, this could be something like a tapeworm living inside of an organism. So we'll talk about, there are three types of symbiosis, um, and we'll talk about those in a little bit. Why are ecological interactions important? Interactions can affect the distribution and abundance of organisms, and the interactions can influence evolution. So let's look at one example. We're going to look at competition. Two species use the same limiting resource. So here's an example. Here's P. areola grown separately. This is one type of microorganism. And here's a different one, P. caudatum. And that one grows a little bit faster at first, and they end up here at this carrying capacity. And same thing when this one's grown alone. When you have this species and this species living together, this P. caudatum grows faster at first, but then the P. areola outcompetes it. And by the end, you get mostly P. areola with very little, little P. caudatum. So this one was the better competitor for that particular environment. Predation is eating of live organisms. One thing that that does is population control. So here's an example. These are sea stars, and they control the abundance of mussels and barnacles. So it's just one example of how predation affects the abundance of, um, of or the, you know, the, the number of um, the prey. And so here's um, a starfish or a sea star, and it actually digests, this is kind of gross, but it'll digest the mussel that holds this shellfish together. And as that gets digested, the, the shell will actually start to open, and then that's when they're going to eat most of the insides. So this is showing some species diversity. Um, here's what it would typically look like. Um, this is species diversity, meaning the number of different types of shellfish living um, in an intertidal zone. And so this is showing a pretty high species diversity. So you have lots of sea stars eating mussels, and because of that, there are lots of other types of shellfish that can live there. In an experimental area, scientists took a starfish and what happened is that the mussels did great because uh, no one was eating them and all the other organisms that lived there died pretty much and so you have this decrease in species diversity increases in species diversity the predators maintain diversity by controlling the number of potentially dominant species the next one um, predation drives the evolution of predator and prey species so speed, strength, teeth, intelligence, these are all things that can be affected by predator-prey relationships. So if the prey gets um, faster or can hide better, the selective pressure would be for the predator to um, increase its speed or to be able to have better eyesight. So in other words, the organisms with the better eyesight who can distinguish um, a hidden prey would actually do better, and the prey that can hide better would do better. So they can affect each other's evolution. Defensive adaptations happen in plants. So for example, there are structures like thorns and spines that will inhibit animals from eating them. There are also chemicals like nicotine, morphine, strychnine, which is a poison, and cinnamon, cloves, and peppermint, which are, believe it or not, distasteful when you don't have sugar with them. So those are all types of um, defenses that plants have evolved over time to stop animals from eating them so much. Here are defensive adaptations in animals. This is one of the coolest ever. So <laughs> this looks a whole lot like a turd, but it's actually um, a type of caterpillar, which is totally cool. And this looks like a, a stick, but it's actually a, another type of caterpillar. 
So concealment and camouflage, disguised appearance like the walking stick here, um, the peppered moth, which is one we talk about with evolution. That's a moth that blends in with, with the trees that it lives on. Caterpillar looking like a bird poop. Ew, I just love that one. No, nope, wait, two more minutes, Dave, William. Disagreeable taste, odor, or spray. So the stink pug, um, the monarch butterfly, and the bombardier beetle. So this one um, stinks, this one tastes bad, and so the bright coloring is to tell it, um, predators to not eat it. And then the bombardier beetle, which we'll talk about here. They inject an explosive mixture of chemicals and enzymes into a reaction chamber in their abdomen. And the mixture of chemicals and enzymes volatilizes, which means it turns to gas, instantly upon contact with the air, generating a puff of smoke and an audible popping sound, which will hopefully scare off the predator that was going to eat him. Anti-predator defenses. So here's a pretty frog. Do you like the frog, William? Mm -hmm. This is warning coloration. It teaches predators to avoid this species. So this is a poisonous, poisonous frog, and it's advertising that. And then here are a couple of types of um, wasps, and some of them look with some of them have this this coloration of yellow, black, yellow, black to warn off any predators to say, "Hey, I sting." And then there are some that will actually just mimic the other one, and it's okay, and will have that weird coloration because um, it, it protects them because the other one has the the um, sting. So you look at all these butterflies that taste bad, they all look alike because if a predator has been warned by eating one, it will avoid all the others. So this is absolutely affecting the evolution of all of these butterflies. Mimicry. Harmless species mimics unpalatable, which means they taste yucky, or dangerous species. So for example, the hawk moth larva looks like a snake, at least a little bit. So there's um, just a moth larva, so in other words, a, a caterpillar. Um, but it kind of looks like a snake. It's a little bit scary at first, maybe um, scary enough to, to fend off um, a bird. And here's another one. Here's the model. This is a snake that will bite you and is poisonous. And here's its mimic. Looks a whole lot like it, enough so that predators will avoid it. This guy, I don't know, let's see, red, black, white, black, red. I don't know, is that the mimic or is that the model? Looks like the mimic to me. I guess he's not crazy. Here's another one. Here's the model. This is a, a wasp that will um, bite you and it hurts. It will sting you. And these are mimics. That means they don't sting, but they certainly look like the stingers, at stinging kind, enough so that um, maybe birds won't eat them. Okay, that's going to be it. Because we run out of time. There we go.